And welcome each and every one of you. This is the Appraiser Coach Podcast. You have found us, folks, and appreciate you spreading the word. We're growing, 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 almost at that 200 thousand download mark folks it's super exciting so continue to spread the word to your appraiser friends across the country i want to remind you we are sponsored by ala mode ala mode right now offering a 10-year price guarantee at 349 per year uh, you can find that at alamo.com slash free trial once again alamo.com slash free trial also sponsored by working re magazine where you can find out what's going on in your industry right now by going to workingre.com. That's workingre, as in workingrealestate.com. And finally, we are sponsored by Datamaster, who are making all kinds of changes to their software. But uh, I'll tell you, folks, you need to check them out. You need to go to datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach. Datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach will give you full 14 days, two weeks, free of charge, any and all Data Master has to offer. Well, folks, I want to welcome back to the program a good friend of mine. He's been on a couple of times now, and uh, uh, a guy I highly respect in the appraisal industry. His name is Mr. Dave Town. Welcome, Dave. Well, hi, Dustin. How are you this morning? I am I am super, super good and, and super excited to have you on again. Uh, folks, for those of you who don't know Dave, uh, go back and, and search my um, my podcast. You can just go right into the podcast page itself and just search for Dave Town, T-O-W-N-E, and you can listen to a couple of episodes where he has been on. But uh, the gist of it is this. This guy knows what he's doing. He's an appraiser for many years up in the Washington area, and uh, he is a friend of appraisers across the nation in the sense that uh, he is a great source of information. Uh, if you're not on his email list, you need to be. Dave, uh, give us that email uh, that uh, basically you need to send him an email and say, hey, I want you to, to, to include me on your email list. Uh, Dave, what is that email address? Yeah, and when they send, if they would, please put their name on there and the state they are in. That's how I keep track of the uh, addresses I have in my address book. The address is lowercase letter D, and my last name spelled out, which is T-O-W-N, as in Nancy, E, at Fidelgo.net. Fidelgo, F, as in Frank, I, D, as in Dave, a L as in Larry G O dot net. Perfect. So folks, and, and again, the reason you want to be on there is Dave is expert at scouring the news for, I don't even know how he does it, but he finds every and all news stories related to appraisers, even semi related to appraisers and uh, on a regular basis sends out an email and gives us a heads up. And that's really why I wanted you to have on you, uh, have you on the program again, Dave. I received an email from you, well, you. a couple of weeks ago that uh, talked a little bit about some of the uh, interesting things that you're finding in, uh, I assume, reviews. You didn't actually say that, but I'm assuming you're, you're reviewing, peer reviewing maybe some other reports and finding some, some difficulties. Did I get that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, based on my, my elevated stature that you have uh, awarded me with here, a, a nationwide appraiser, basically, uh, I receive appraisal reports from various sources and uh, yes i do do reviews from time to time but i also receive reports from other people and uh, so i take a look at them and one of the reports i received uh, recently within the last month kind of jumped out at me and that was the reason for my email gotcha okay. so if we uh, if we want to start talking a little bit about this the whole idea of this though by the way is to to help appraisers do better uh, reports so that they aren't reviewed so anally by some of the people out there in the review world and underwriters and so forth. I think a lot of cases appraisers just don't put enough detail in their reports and then when they have details some of the detail uh, doesn't quite fit logically at least in the way I think and, and act and do and write reports. So to, to dive into this thing uh, the thing that really jumped out at me on this particular report and generated my uh, email initially was the fact that many adjustments or some adjustments, I guess, in reports are not rounded, but the rest of the adjustments are. And I have a report sitting here in front of me, and we need to start first with the sale price of the property. In most cases, except in oddball situations, the sale price of the property, generally speaking, is rounded to the nearest $100. They don't normally sell property for oddball figures like $273,611. And, and don't forget uh, the 11 cents. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, in most cases, it's rounded off. And in this case, the sale price of the property was $875,000. So now working down the grid, we come to a location adjustment, which is an even dollar figure of 20000 We come to a site size adjustment that is $10,748. <laughs> The next adjustment under that is a view adjustment for $50,000 even. And then moving on down the grid, uh, uh, on the uh, GLA, it comes out to $20,880. <laughs> and my point in this is, why do appraisers use oddball figures like that? Um, I can tell you why, Dave. On the same res- and I well, and I know you know the answer as well. I'm questioning. <laughs> <laughs> they do it because they don't. They're not. They just accept what a computer-generated program tells them. Exactly. To do. Uh, on the other column, we have a, a sales price of seven hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, top of the grid. Coming down to the GLA, the GLA adjustment is one thousand and twenty dollars. I have actually seen reports where the GLA adjustment is to the nearest dollar mm-hmm. figure. In other words, one dollar, uh, three dollars, whatever. Right. I think that's we're we appraisers are just not that good, and I think for the clarity of a report. Wait, 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 wait. Sp- speak for your lost. Dave. Speak for yourself, man. I'm that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, Some appraisers yeah, are not that good. The <laughs> Then we get down to the bottom of the grid, and we've got all these oddball numbers, mm. and yet the opinion of market value on this particular report, even though we have weird numbers in the adjusted sales price of comparis- comparables, it's rounded off, right. believe it or not. <laughs> Shocker. I could, I could so, have finished your sentence. So, so, I, 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 just, I, I just suggest <laughs> to appraisers, use rounding. Use, uh, <laughs> I, I set mine to $100. Yeah. I mean, come on, are we any better than that? Yeah. Well, you know, and and when I was when I was trained, I was uh, I was told that I should measure with a micrometer and cut with a chainsaw, uh, and I think that's kind of what you're yes. what you're getting at. We should be as as detailed as yeah. possible, but then we need to step back and say, okay, really, <laughs> am I am I really that good? Yeah. So uh, yeah, and I and I, and I and just don't rely on the automatic adjustment things that are coming out of various perfect. computerized yeah. software. So I want to I want to emphasize, and I know you mentioned this up front. The purpose of today's episode is not to come down on appraisers. It's not to criticize. It's it's to improve your appraisal reports. Some of the things I think, Dave. Right probably appraisers don't even think about. Um, you know, we get in this routine and we start doing what we do and, uh, and, and you know, we accept whatever kicks out at the, at the end without stepping back. You know, I call it the, the fourth approach to value. I know you've, uh, you and I have talked about that before. Uh, you know, we step back and we say, you know, the, the fourth approach to value is not the income approach, not the cost approach, not the market approach. It's the, what the hell would I pay for this property approach? You know, and I think the same yeah. principle applies here as well. We get so used to allowing the computer to do our work for us that we forget to step back and say, okay, hold on a second. Does this look right? Why doesn't it look right? And what can I do to change it? Exactly. So one, Well, let's move on because we only have a certain uh, amount of time here, Dustin. Before, so, uh, before we do, I Dave, I want to I make one suggestion. I'm not, I'm not familiar with all of the software out there intimately, but I do know... Uh, because I've used Alamode forever, I do know that Alamode allows you, uh, yes, they do automatic adjustments. Again, you have complete control over that. In other words, don't just relinquish your control. We had a, a we had a, an episode just a couple of weeks ago um, that I think it was called something like uh, computer generated incompetency. And we talked about relying too much on the computer that we forget to be appraisers. So go back and listen to that episode. I think it's important. But I do want to point out that Alamode will not only adjust automatically as we set up the rules and the perimeters, but will also round if we tell it to. I think most appraisers probably are just automatically putting information in there and they're forgetting to put in the fact that you can round to the nearest hundred or the nearest thousand or whatever you choose in there. So just something to, to keep in that's mind. Right. Okay, number two. And that's what I do. I have a universal rounding on every single adjustment in the grid to a $100 increment level. Some people are, think that's too uh, too close. Then, okay, set it to $500. 
whatever. Just, you know, coming down to a, an even dollar figure or a $10 figure, I, I just think is, is crazy. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I want to take you to Nome, Alaska. <laughs> wow. Clear up there in the Arctic Circle. Okay. And we're going to talk about an appraisal uh, up there, and we're going to describe the the uh, house according to what's on page one here where it says describe the condition of the property and what this says is the subject has been substantially updated and is considered to be in good condition most of the observable surfaces have been replaced or renovated the subject suffers less than typical depreciation for the area and has the appeal of a newer home okay okay on the on the surface that's not too bad. All right. It doesn't really say much about the property in Nome, Alaska. Well, I was, so was going to say, is this our, uh, is this an igloo? Or is this an actual? <laughs> I'm uh, kidding. It, it could be an igloo, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh-huh. And now we're going to get on our dog sled and come down to the lower 48 and get a truck driver to haul us down to Key West, Florida. Okay. And we're going to do a, an appraisal of a house in Key West, Florida. And we are going to write, the subject has been substantially updated and is considered to be in good condition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. What I'm suggesting here is appraisers are not really describing much about the property in that particular place under the improvements section on page one. I'm suggesting that appraisers really need to get away from these boilerplate statements mm. that can apply to Nome or Key West or, or uh, Upper Maine to Southern California and actually tell people what's on the inside of the house. This also helps justify why a person selects the quality rating that they have selected right. in the report. And I will ask this question, where in the report does quality rating show up? Where is the justification for that? You're asking me? The answer is no. <laughs> well, sort of, but I'm also asking a blanket question to appraisers in this. Where does it show up? Where does the justification for your rating that you put on, uh, your quality rating that you put on page two, show up anywhere in the report? Right. But it's it going to be bottom of page, page one. Up. Exactly. And that's what I do here. In my reports, I say the quality rating is X because of Y. And I explain why in those description uh, right there. So that that keeps me out of hot water with uh, with reviewers and other people and underwriters saying, well, you know, we looked at the MLS photographs and we don't think your quality rating is good. Right. That was well, a pretty good impression. People don't say why. Okay, so yeah. what okay. you're saying, Dave, <laughs> is is when Dustin Harris puts on his report, the subject is a single family home in good condition. That's not enough. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, maybe I'm too anal about this, but I do describe uh, floor coverings throughout the home, and I, discuss, and I discuss the cabinetry in the kitchen and bathrooms, and I discuss the counter surfaces. Okay. Those, I realize that's pretty anal, but those drive quality. Absolutely. As well as fenestrations of the house and so forth and the design and so forth. But the quality really comes from interior components that are put into a home. And so I will, uh, I will say what those components are. Now, maybe some people will object and say, well, now you're becoming an insurance adjuster. Well, yeah. no, I'm not. I'm describing what I saw when I went into that house. No, I'm going to tell you, to I'm going to tell you a quick story and then I'm going to be the devil's advocate on this for just a second. So the quick story is this. Uh, I used to be very um, irritated by the fact that Fannie Mae forms do not have the countertops. I thought, you know, seriously? There's a difference between a house that has a laminate countertop and one that's got a granite or quartz countertop, right? I mean, everybody would agree yes, on that, absolutely. right? And then I stepped back and yeah, I said, but they hey, wait a second. Waste, waste, waste. Right, right, exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> Good point. Why is that on there? I have no idea. So then, then I have to step back and ask myself, well, Dustin, hold on. Are you a form filler? Or are you an appraiser? Just because the form doesn't say what is the countertop doesn't mean that you shouldn't describe it. And so now I do. Okay, there you go. I was vulnerable yes. for you, Dave. Um, here's <laughs> well, that's cool. here's the way I'm going to play the devil's advocate for just a second, and I and, and I agree on on most of what you're saying, but I I think some of my listeners would say, "What? Well, hey, hold on a second, Dave. You do describe the property in the form itself. You've got lines that say what are the floor coverings. You've got lines that say again bathroom wainscot, whatever." Um, you've got this description. It's just not done in a narrative form. What do you say to that? 
that uh, yeah, I can I can see the point to that because in the upper uh, section there, right above what we're talking about here in the improvements, they do talk about uh, foundation walls and floors and walls and and so forth and so on. It doesn't mention counters and it doesn't mention cabinetry though. So I think we can do a better job just by doing uh, more descriptive. Uh, writing about what's actually in the house that the appraiser observed. Agreed. So I'll just leave it at that. Agreed. Okay, number three. Okay, let's move on because we only have a certain amount of time here. One thing I wanted to mention is uh, on the uh, on the sketch that I see so many appraisers do, um, and I need to back up, we need to tell uh, the readers in our reports what kind of bathrooms these are, whether they're a full bathroom or a half bathroom. Fannie Mae, as you know, does not allow for a three-quarter bath right. or a one-quarter bath in some cases. But what I see on sketches so often is people just put bath and they don't on the sketch, and they don't say what kind of a bath that is, whether it's full or a half. So it's really very simple. Just to add an extra word on there when you're doing your sketch to say full bath in this location, half bath in that location. That's all. Okay. It, just, it helps clarify for the reader and for the reviewers that you are uh, your report is actually matching up with what you have elsewhere. So you're, you're yeah. So when you sent this list over to me, you said uh, baths aren't labeled full, full or half, and I, that surprised me a bit. You're talking on the sketch, not on the report itself. Yeah. The reason it surprised me is UAD requires right. that you that you separate that. Yes, it does. Okay. But uh, like I said, many people on their sketches will not uh, show what type of bathroom those are. And I think just for clarity purposes, that really adds something to the sketch. Good suggestion. We're not saying you have to put the walls in. Just put a label on the on the bathroom, uh, full or half, Perfect. whichever. Perfect. So, all right. Number all four. Right, and the other one I wanted to mention was uh, most of our appraisal reports these days, at least uh, for many of us, I see, aren't any more than about 22 to 25 pages total everything from the table of contents page all the way back to my last page is my location uh, a map page uh, but I recently looked at a report now I, I just said 22 to 25 pages I just looked at a report that had an addendum in the report that was 22 pages long oh come on this was not a narrative so no, it was not a narrative report. It was a form report on a 1004, but the addendum itself was 22 pages long. Wow. Now, I'm pretty anal about my stuff. My addendums run five to six, maybe seven pages at the max. Uh, the way I do my reports, I have everything pre-written, and then I take out what I don't need. Okay. That way it's just easier for me to understand. I read through the addendum when I'm doing my report, make sure I have everything in that needs to be left in, and I take out what does not need to be in there. Right. But in this case, the appraiser went, I mean, good night. He even talked about what kind of nails were used in the uh, in the siding and so forth. And oh, so come on. on. And all kinds of you're ex for, you're well, exa I, I'm exaggerating. But, <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but, I mean, a 22-page addendum is way over the top. Absolutely. So my suggestion to appraisers is make your reports better, uh, be brief, give the proper information, but you don't have to go into humongous detail about why uh, uh, why something is done the way it is in a certain neighborhood or whatever. Just be brief. Write a few sentences about it if you feel you need to, but don't go into an elaborate amount of detail. The reviewers and the uh, underwriters of our reports don't have the time. You've got to remember that they're doing multiple reports a day, and we're only doing maybe one or two at the max, you know. Right. So they, they just don't have time to read through all of that stuff. So Let me ask you a question, Dave, kind of, kind of related to the topic here. What are, what are your thoughts on CYA statements? Uh, sometimes they're called canned uh, comments. Sometimes they're called boilerplate. Uh, but the gist of it is that we have some statements in there that cover our backside for certain things that often come up with underwriting, may come up, you know, in front of a state board. Uh, I have heard pros and I've heard cons. I've heard negative. I've heard positive on, on this. Uh, I know some appraisers say no boilerplate at all. Every statement that you make in, in a report has to be specifically related to the appraisal itself. I've heard others, you know, that uh, uh, I think, you know, you brought up an extreme example, 22-page uh, addendum. I certainly wouldn't go to that uh, side, but I can tell you what I do. I've got some boilerplate in there. 
Um, but I also get very specific when it comes to reconciliation and explaining what I've done as far as my process goes. In other words, I have a mixture of both. Yes. That's the way I write my reports, too. I just said a moment ago that I pre-write everything in my addendums and elsewhere on the report form itself. I have all kinds of content in the reports. And then I go through the report page by page, line by line, and so forth, and I take out what I don't need, and then I add what I do need if I haven't covered it. Uh, yes, I do use pre-written comments. Some people call it boilerplate. I just say it's, uh, it's, it's specific to this report. And it is relative to the property that we are uh, phrasing, and it's relative to the comparables we are using. So I don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, okay. So much of our work is based on, uh, on the uh, uh, fire probes that we get stuck in our arse from people who have read our reports in the past. And so, yeah, <laughs> now, arse, is that, a, is that an attention. official term? <laughs> <laughs> it, yes, it is. It's, uh, you'll find it in the appraisal of, of real estate and also in the dictionary. Okay, I'll look, that, I'll look that up. Um, <laughs> but my point is, yeah, oftentimes we in the past have forgotten to make a comment about a certain item or whatever, and a reviewer has caught that and said, would you please make a comment about X? And so we do, and we write Y to cover X, and we leave it in our addendum or we leave it in our report form. Uh, comment section or whatever. So that's how I do my work. Uh, these things just take so long to write, and so I think you have to have some of that in right, there. Right. Uh, otherwise, you'd be spending three or four days custom writing every single statement, every single word and sentence in a report, and that's that's way beyond what... Uh, what I think we need to do. Well, and I think as appraisers, we do need to think about the, the fact that we are dealing, of course, with uh, the appraisal process. And an appraisal process is different, folks, than an appraisal. An appraisal report is different than an appraisal process. And we need to understand that there really is two things that we're dealing with. And sometimes when we get to the um, appraisal report, we forget that there's a process that we're going through as well, and we need to describe that process. Our intended user needs to understand what we are doing. And so that's where the addendum comes in. That's where the explanations come in. That's where the detail, a lot of the stuff goes on in our head, and we forget that we need to, you know, we're talking to somebody. We're an author here, and we need to author the report in such a way that the intended user understands it. One of those ways that you can do that very quickly and easily is with all mode software. all mode allows you to be able to use multiple monitors and separate the addendum from the report itself. Folks, picture this. You're sitting in front of the computer and you start to make an adjustment that you know you're going to later need to describe. There's a couple of things that you can do here. You can pause what you're doing. You can switch to another page, your addendum page. You can write the explanation as to what you did about comparable to and why there's a, a condition adjustment there. And you can describe that. And then you can skip back to the grid and continue to make your adjustments. Or you could write that down as a note. So you're physically writing on a piece of paper and hoping you remember to go back to it later on. Or what most appraisers do is they just hope they'll go back to it later on without any notes. And and sometimes those things get forgotten. Well, folks, Alamode has solved that problem. Imagine yourself sitting in front of your computer. You've got more than one monitor. You take the addendum page and physically separate it. When I say physically, digitally, okay? <laughs> separate it from the report itself. So you've got the grid on one side and you've got your addendum on another monitor. As you go through the process of making adjustments, you immediately skip to the other monitor. You don't have to close anything. You don't have to switch anything. You write the statement that you know will be a question to an underwriter's mind or an intended user's mind. And then you go back very simply and seamlessly to your adjustment. Folks, that's the kind of things that Alamote offers that I don't think are offered with any other software provider. Check them out right now for free. You can try them for 15 days at alamode.com slash free trial. That's alamode.com slash free trial, or you can call them at 800 alamode Folks, I talked about uh, Dave uh, sending me lots of information, and I, and I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, on a regular basis, I get his emails. I really do think you ought to sign up for those because he gives very pertinent information. Uh, there's been several times of uh, that, that Dave has given me a heads up on something that I had no idea was going on, was a timely thing, you know, whether it be input uh, at the AQB or uh, some other thing that was uh, that was essential that we get on it right away. Uh, I rely on Dave uh, to send me that information, and I appreciate that. Another place that I go on a regular basis to get information is Working RE. Why? 
Working RE understands appraisers. That's the business that they are in. Information for appraisers. Now you can wait for their print magazine and that's great. I love the print magazine. I take it on, on trips with me. Uh, when I'm on the airplane, uh, I, I read it from front to back. Love the magazine. But if I want up-to-date, what's going on today information, I go to workingre.com. You should as well. That's workingre.com, as in workingrealestate.com. And finally, folks, we are sponsored today by Data Master. I have been on the phone several times with Data Master over the last several weeks. They have given me a sneak peek at some of the changes that they are making to their software. Folks, I'm telling you, their software was amazing before. It will blow you out of the water when you, they come up with a new version next year. Uh, some of the features that they are adding are just incredible. But folks, let's not talk about what's coming. Let's talk about what's right here. How would you like to save 30 to 60 minutes per report? You can with all the mo, or excuse me, you can. Sorry, editor. How would you like to save 30 to 60 minutes per report? Folks, you can right now with Data Master. How would you like to stop the, the endless, tedious data entry that you do with your comps and your MC sheet and the top of page one with, with the subject? These are things that, folks, we have to do every single time. Data Master will do that for you and improve the quality at the same time because you're not going to have human error. Now, you need to check the report because you need to make sure that the MLS put it in correctly, but whatever is put in the MLS will transfer directly to your report. That's why it saves you time, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Check them out for 14 days right now at datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach. Once again, it's datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach. And welcome back, folks. We are talking with Dave Town from Washington State. Dave, welcome back to the program. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Dustin. Your comment about dual monitors is absolutely spot on. Uh, actually, I'm going to be moving, hopefully after the first of the year, to a third monitor. And I know some other people around the country use uh, four monitors and so forth. That's, that's one of the most efficient ways a person can increase their productivity when doing appraisal reports is to have multiple monitors you know i don't talk uh, about that very often on one. I, I said i don't talk yeah, about that very often down. because it's been so long since i switched to it but i remember when i switched to it just absolutely being blown away at the increase in productivity yeah. and the cost of of less printing when i was able to pull up things on two monitors. i mean i did this six seven years ago so it's been a long time but uh, i'll tell you if you haven't done it folks you need to do it right away and that can even be done with a uh, laptop. You know, you can hook a second monitor into a laptop and, and code your machine so that, you, that the uh, machine, the laptop, recognizes the second monitor. So when people go into the field with their laptop and do some of their work in the field on their laptop and then bring it back to their office, they really should plug in a second monitor in there just to, just to help their efficiency. So anyway, Absolutely. So we're kind of a little bit off the subject. I wanted to invite you to a Christmas party. Well, actually, I should call it a holiday party. <laughs> No, I think I'm going to call it Christmas party because that's the season we're in. Okay. Or it could be a Hanukkah party, okay, for those of you people who are, are, are Jewish. Uh, but I'm going to hand you a plat map to show you uh, what neighborhood my home is in because you haven't been to my home before. Uh, but on the plat map itself, my home is not indicated anywhere on that plat map. And this is the plat map that came out of a recent appraisal report that was done on my property. And I wanted you to use that plat map so you can find my house to come to the party. Well, the problem is my house on a particular street doesn't have any indicator where the heck it is. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is I'd drive around the neighborhood until you see the holiday balloons that are tied to the windshield wiper <laughs> of the car parked out in front. Okay, this is working. Okay, I'm going, a little bit, I'm, going, I'm going a little bit sideways on you here. But my point is I've, I've read reports where plat maps are in the report, and most uh, most uh, clients want to see a plat map, but the appraiser does not indicate which actual subdivided site is the subject. And that's easy to do. You can put the arrow on, you can drag the arrow in onto your map from the program itself, you can uh, scan it in and you know, use a sticky arrow like we all used to do, or you could use an electronic arrow, whatever, or you can even take a highlighter, like a pink highlighter, for instance, and color the uh, subdivision a lot and scan that into your report. Whatever your method is, I'm suggesting that your report will be much more easily understood by the readers on the other end. If gotcha, you show gotcha. Where okay. Where the property is. I'm with you, Dave. So and when, when this you. This also applies to. 
<laughs> well, I was going to say, when you sent me this, I, I actually, I, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, I don't do this. But now that you describe what you're talking about, I absolutely do do this every time. I thought you meant that, that you're seeing reports that people have not drawn the location of the house on the on the property itself, on the on the plat. And I thought, well, man, I don't, I don't do that. Maybe I should be. Uh, <laughs> but it seemed like a little overkill. What you're saying is you've got a plat map with a bunch of a bunch of lots and the reader doesn't know which unless they look up the lot and look up the block and, and match the things up they don't see where that thing is actually located exactly okay all right and I'm the plan maps are important because it gives a context of what the neighborhood looks like where the house is located is it a subdivision you know in, a, in an urban city or is it out in the country somewhere on acreage either way it doesn't matter it should be shown on the plat map and the same applies by the way i've got some other notes here for the aerial photographs that we sometimes put into the reports for the flood maps that we put into reports. And uh, those I see sometimes that are in these reports and don't have any indicators on aerial photos or, uh, or the flood maps. It just seems kind of, kind of strange to me that you wouldn't indicate in your report where the property is located. Okay, so, so for those that are following along so, in their book at home, um, we're, we're doing a top <laughs> 10 list today of uh, of ways we can improve reports. Again, we're not being critical of other appraisers. We're simply saying, here's some things to think about that may help us to become better appraisers. So you've hit number five. Uh, you now hit number seven, which was the aerial photos. Uh, let's skip now and, and, and go back and, and hit number six, because I, I, I want to talk to you about this well, one. Six, yeah, six on my list is something that I started doing a number of years ago. Now, this has to do with taking the street photo for the, uh, for the appraisal we're doing. So okay. what many appraisers do is they come to the house Maybe they park in front of the house, they get out of their car, and they turn left and they take a picture of the street, and then they turn right and take a picture of the street. Okay, you've basically satisfied what, uh, what many lenders and Fannie Mae and GSEs and so forth say to do. You take a picture of the street. But the problem is, when you do it that way, you don't really show the context of the house on the street. So what I'm suggesting that people do, and this is what I do, I take photos from both directions. I will drive up to the property. I'll figure out where the property is. I'll go beyond the property by the next house or the next two houses down the street, turn around, take a picture of the street with the house that I'm appraising on the side of the photo so it shows up a little bit. Not the whole house, but just the front of it so it shows the context of the street. Uh, and the house on the street, and I'll do the same thing coming from the other direction. And then I'll, here lately, I've been using both street scenes. Now, I realize that many appraisers say, oh, my God, you're just being too anal about all this <laughs> stuff, and I'm just going to take a picture of the street. But, again, we're trying to make reports better for people who are looking at our reports and trying to understand where this property is located within a particular area. And if you give context to what you're doing, you will have less callbacks. And that's really another reason why we're talking about this stuff today is try to uh, try to eliminate and uh, bring down the number of correction notices or stip reports or stips right. that we get. Uh, just make the reports a little bit better, and uh, uh, your work will be appreciated when you do uh, some of these things that I've mentioned. So okay, so let so me. That's why, and you you wanted to yeah. Just let me let me push back for just a second. So. I'm not a I'm not a buy the book guy. Um, in other words, I don't just do the letter of the law thing. I always like to ask myself why. Why is it that I do what I do? In other words, I ask myself the question: Why is it that I take a street photo to begin with? You know, why is it that we do anything? And and if the answer is what I was taught, then then I I take exception to to including the subject house in there. And it, to me, it seems like overkill. What I'm getting at, uh, Dave, is is I want you to tell me the purpose of including the house in there because my training included the reason you take – see, my, my dad was my mentor, and I remember very clearly uh, I asked him the question, does it matter which way I take the street photo? Because back then you just took it one way. I, I do both now, but back then it was just it was just one right. street photo, and and his answer to Taken me from the front of the property, the side the sidewalk looking down the street, yeah, but out yeah, the house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And I said, you okay. know, which which direction do I take? And he said, take the picture that most depicts the neighborhood. And so to me, it always stuck in my head that the reason the street photo was even there is to show 
the reader what the neighborhood looks like. Not where the house sits in regard to the neighborhood, but what the neighborhood looks like. So that's why I, I push back a little yep. bit and, and, and help me explain or help me understand why include the subject in the street photo. Well, because we've all we've all done this. You know, you've been an appraiser for 20 years. I've been an appraiser for almost 16 years. We've all gone out to the property. We've appraised the property. We've taken our front side, rear, and so forth and so on. And you know what? We've driven away and we've forgotten the street scene photograph. And so now we're 20 miles away from the property. And what do we do? Are we going to get in our car and go back again? Or are we going to go hunt through our files of other reports? <laughs> I would up never do a that. Dave. Street scene photo <laughs> of something else that maybe it's on the block over, uh -huh, sure. but it's not really the uh, same street that the house is on. So I'm just suggesting that while your dad was correct, it shows the context of the neighborhood to stand on the sidewalk and take a picture of the street scene going down the street or up the street without the house in the photo. I'm just suggesting that showing the house actually physically present on that street on the edge of the photograph and then in the comment when you when you put the photo in the report you say subject at left or subject to the left or or in the cases of these rural properties what I do is I'll say subject driveway at the mailbox on the left that sort of thing uh, that way the reader who's looking at our report knows that you actually were physically present at that particular property gotcha. and uh, it, it shows in the report that way again like you said it's not a requirement to do this Some, saying, sometimes it is it, it may be a client requirement it may be a client requirement yes and that's kind of where i came off of, uh, of doing this or, or started doing this is because i did have uh, one or two clients ask for for that sort of thing usually it was these big banks that have you know 57 pages of thou shalt do <laughs> in their uh, reporting requirements and that's where this one came well from. and i'll tell you dave I, I went to a new a new uh, um a new policy in our office um from now on any engagement letter that's any longer than 56 pages, we, we just turn it down. So 57 would not even touch our office. All right, number eight. <laughs> oh, man, that's a good one. Okay, uh, number eight on my list had to do with UAD ratings. Now, we're talking about quality and condition ratings, the one through five numbers. And what I've seen happen is people use UAD ratings on reports or on the forms that are not UAD coded. And the one, there's two forms, I guess, the uh, 1004C for manufactured mm -hmm. and the 1025 forms. Neither one of those are UAD formatted reports. And yet we see people putting in uh, C3 uh, for condition and Q4 for quality on those forms but then, when they do that, they never put in the definition page mm. for what those numbers mean. So, in effect, you've produced a report that's not credible when you put information in a report that no one can understand. So, what I'm suggesting to people is if you've got a client that forces you to use the UAD on non-UAD formatted reports, put the definition page in so that they know. And then the other thing that I see is the same thing happens when you're using the, the uh, general purpose forms that all of the various uh, software providers have. Right. And people put in UAD coding in those and, again, don't have any kind of definition for what those mean. Now, um, I go way off the deep end on this one because... If you don't mind, I want to take a, a minute more and describe something. On page one, no, no, let's do it this way. On page two, there are a list of, in the grid, on page two in the grid, there are a list of banned words that the GSEs refuse to let us use. Right. When we're talking about quality and condition. You know, and, the and old style. average right. good, fair, excellent. And all that stuff. Yeah, I'm not worried about that, but I'm... I'm talking about now we're talking about condition okay. so we have uh we have the banned words we can't use average condition anymore we can't use excellent condition in the grid but on page one over there in the improvement section on the far right hand side where it says materials 
slash condition, Fannie Mae, in their wisdom, has allowed the banned words to be used instead of using the numerical rating number. Right. I when when UAD came out, I said this is screwy. This is absolutely nuts. They didn't think it through carefully enough when they designed this system that they put into place back in 2000, what was it, 9 or 11? I can't remember the date now. But at any rate, they said, yeah, you can use those banned words that we don't want you to use on page two, but you can certainly use those on page one. My point here is if you're going to use average stating the condition of the uh, foundation wall, on page one, you better damn well put a definition of what you mean by average in the report because you have not done a credible report if you have not described what that coding means that you've used. Well, and this issue is a, is a hard one, I think, because uh, we get, again, this goes back to computer-generated incompetency. Um, we get mm -hmm. used to relying on our computer system. So, you know, I might do an appraisal on a property and I might use three comps. Uh, and this is on a UAD form, and so I do a Q3 and I do a, um, let's say, a C4. And uh, and let's say two weeks later, I'm doing a private appraisal, and I use that same comp. Well, that comp is already in my database because I use all the mode and I save all of my comps in the database so I don't have to retype them. So when it comes back up, it pops up, and sure enough, it's going to fill out the form with the Q and the C ratings that I put in at, at the UAD. Here's my question, Dave. Um, in, in a situation like that, um, is there anything wrong with using the UAD ratings as long as you put the UAD description in the report so that the user understands what a Q3 actually means? Yeah, that's what I said initially. If you're going to use a definition or if you're going to use a word that doesn't show up anywhere in your report, you better define it. Well, and I know, you, I know you said that earlier, and the reason I'm pushing back a little bit is I've actually yeah. had appraisers tell me that you cannot use UAD ratings on anything but a UAD report. I don't know. Again, users, oh, uh, listeners, help me. If, if that's accurate, I, I want to know. You know where, where does that, uh, that justification come from? I'm thinking if you put the UAD in think there. I don't there's any, any law or rule or okay. reg at all that says you cannot use it, but I wouldn't. I, I think that's crazy because this is uh, UAD is designed by Fannie Mae, right. specifically Fannie Mae, and then it was adopted by uh, uh, um, Freddie Mac. Actually, I guess the two went together on this, but at any rate, these are GSE specific uh, proprietary coding systems for their forms only. That's what they're for. So I would suggest strongly to appraisers not to use those in non-UAD forms and non-UAD reports. So that's just me, but I, I tend to be anal retentive about a lot of this stuff. So. Well, and, and I think it comes <laughs> down to yeah, quality. We need to, you work. know, we need to be proud of the work that we do, and it is our work. Yeah. It's individual, and uh, you know, some of these suggestions I think appraisers are going to take. Uh, some of them are going to say, yeah, you know what, that's a little overkill for me, but that's okay. Our purpose today yeah, is to give you the option. Right. Yeah. And when I do a, G, uh, a GP form report, in other words, a private assignment on a non-GSE form, mm -hmm. when I do a private assignment, I have a list of my definitions for the words that I use for quality and condition. I still use average, good, uh, fair, and so on in my reports for general purpose, private appraisals. But I have a page, or I actually have a, I guess you'd call it a paragraph, for both of those that describes what those words mean. And uh, let's, let's face it, where do we get that information? Well, we get it out of a copyrighted manual that was put out by a certain company that has a couple of initials in their name that is now owned by another big company that starts with C and also has an <laughs> L in their name. Uh, so you have to be hmm. careful on what you use. Um, what I did was I read those definitions out of that particular manual, and then I rewrote them to my own way of, of writing so that they are not copyrighted. Uh, it's not directly the same wording as right. it is in those in that manual. So that's what I do. And that way when somebody reads one of my reports that's a general purpose form private appraisal assignment, they want to know what average means, they can look in the addendum and they can see what, what I've determined 
the definition for average is in, in that particular report. Great suggestion. What else are you finding in reports? Okay, one last item here that we uh, we had on the list that we were going to talk about this morning. Now, wait a second. Is, my, my, my numbering is we're at number nine, which means uh, we've got, well, we've I, got I, two that, more. That was flood map. <laughs> <laughs> I already covered flood map. That was a while ago. Okay, all right. Uh, not showing the property location. But anyway, number 10 was uh, what I said here is corrected reports don't disclose the requested correction and what was done and only include the corrections that are buried within the report itself. Okay. So what I mean by this is uh, what I've read from many appraisers around the country and I have adopted for myself is anytime I get a correction notice from a lender or from an AMC, I will regurgitate what they're asking me to do. And I put that on an addendum page at the very beginning of the report. That, uh, that new page comes right after the table of contents page, which I use in my reports, okay. and right before the first form page. I put that in there so that it becomes a numbered page in the report and cannot be easily removed if somebody wants to doctor the report later on. Excellent. So in other words, it becomes page two. And on page two of that uh, correction notice addendum is what I call it, and I put a date on the top of it, whatever the date might be, I say, okay, this is what I was asked to do by whomever. And then right below that, then my response and what I've done. And if I've made any changes to the report, I would say, okay, the change was made in this section in the report and so on. Or if I decide not to make any changes, that's what I tell them. Uh, it's my choice, of course. Uh, most times I do make a change uh, to comply, but uh, but I always put that stuff in there. I have seen recently where where I was reading through the report. I had one that I was going to review, was a review assignment, and I was reading through all of the verbiage in the report, and what the appraiser had done in the report that I was given to review was said, well, based on the reviewer's comments, uh, my reply to that is such and so. Well, that wasn't initially written in the report when the report was turned in. That was done as a response right. to the correction notice that the appraiser was sent to comment on. So, But it was just buried in there. You had to read the whole report. You didn't know that a correction had been made to the report until you read the entire report and you found these little comments that, that related back to uh, a previous correction notice. So what I'm suggesting to appraisers is, is we need to have a paper trail so that future reviewers uh, for FDIC, uh, the GSE reviewers, if there's a loan buyback, they can actually see what you were asked to do after you turned in a signed and completed appraisal report. And I think it just is, is more professional to do it that way, and really it keeps the appraiser out of hot water by disclosing exactly what you were asked to do and what you did to correct or, or make a change or add to a report or whatever it was. Well, and I think that's the key right there, uh, Dave. You know, some of these suggestions today are just, hey, let's improve the quality of our reports. Let's, you know, let's put out a good product. Other things, I think, like this, um, can really come back to, to bite us in the in the. What, what did you say? Arse is that is that the the official term uh, that we use now? That was the official term. <laughs> arse, yes. Uh -huh. I think you know. I don't want to. I don't want appraisers to get themselves into trouble. And this is one of those things that you know, folks, cover yourself because, let's face it, as much complaining as we do about AMCs, and a lot of it's justified. I get it. I understand it. Some of the things they come back on us are just ridiculous. I would say that most of the revision requests that I receive are actually things that I should have done up front. Um, that, uh, you know, that, you know, when I look at it that way, when I step back and say, okay, yeah, you know what, when you ask it that way, I can kind of see where I probably should, uh, you know, maybe it's not going to make or break the report, but at least it will improve and not go the other direction. It's very few times when I push back against an AMC and say, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, that would be ridiculous. That would lessen the quality of my report. Most of the time it will go the other direction. So let's do that kind of thing up front and let's make sure that we cover ourselves. Dave, good yeah, suggestions. what you've done. Hey, the other part of this that I didn't put in this comment was if you do make a major change in a report that actually changes the value, maybe you've 
maybe you've added another comparable that you didn't find and it's actually a, a worthy comparable and you realize after you've turned in the original report that you now have a better comparable to put into the report and the value is going to change. What I'm suggesting people do is they produce a brand new report under a brand new appraiser's file number. Right. And so that way it becomes a new report. You don't charge for this. You're making a correction basically, but you have an, a brand new file number so that the lender now has a brand new report in front of them. And uh, that avoids any hassles of uh, on the back end. You've saved in your in your system. You've saved the original report, but now you also have a second report under a different file number, and it is the uh, most recent and most accurate report that you have now. So that's just another little tip and trick technique that I use to uh, to avoid any hassles in the future. I never make a major correction like that to the existing file number report. Excellent. I think it's a great uh, great piece of advice, as is all of the things that you've brought up here today. Dave, any other words of advice as we uh, part ways here today? Uh, please uh, get a really good husky dog if you're going to take that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that trip from Nome down to Florida. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to see the uh, the igloo. Um, I assume I'll see the igloo in Nome and, and not in Florida. Uh, I don't know how long it would last yeah. in uh, in Florida, but uh, great words of advice from yeah. a, from a guy who has seen a lot and uh, who who understands the profession across the uh, United States. Again, Dave, uh, if people want to get on your email list, uh, give that to us one more time. You don't need to spell it out because I will put it in the show notes, but just give it to us as a quick shout out here as we as we part ways. Yeah, I love to hear from people. It's dtown at fidelgo.net. Again, folks, you'll find that in the uh, in the show notes. Dave, once again, always a pleasure to have you on. I'm sure we'll have you on again. Thank you for joining us today, my friend. Well, I enjoyed it, uh, Dustin. Thank you very much for asking me to come here and, uh, and spew my stuff. <laughs> we could go a lot of ways with that, but we'll keep it a family-friendly show. Uh, Dave Town from Washington State, I always appreciate him uh, being on. Folks, if you were helped today by the information here, if you want to continue to improve yourself as an appraiser, uh, will you think about uh, joining me on the All-Star Team? The All-Star Team is a regular newsletter Every month, eight pages, chuck full of information like you heard today, information on better ways, more efficient ways, more effective ways to run your appraisal business, and it's only nine ninety five per month. Uh, you also get to join a team of people online that is very secret, very closed, very uh, intimate group that uh, we're very kind to each other. You can ask any question and not be made fun of uh, on our Facebook group. Uh, hope you will join us. Again, just go to my website, theappraisercoach.com, and check out the All-Star Team. Once again, thanks to Dave Town for joining us, and thanks each of you folks for listening, and we will catch you next time here on the Appraiser Coach Podcast. <music>